ILTV Plus, your news from Israel and more 24-7. Start your free trial today. Subscribe at ILTV.tv and watch from any device. Moving on, as more and more terror attacks are recorded, Israeli security officials are fearing that another major spike in violence may be on the horizon, particularly as Palestinian groups are explicitly threatening as much. The Palestinian Authority, for one, continuing its pay-to-slay policy for which Israel is withholding tax revenues from Ramallah. And the Hamas terror group likewise slamming Israel and Egypt for their blockade around the Strip, while warning that escalations across the region may soon be renewed. This in light of non-specific, quote-unquote, Israeli attacks on Jerusalem and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, as well as floundering indirect ceasefire talks with Israel in Cairo. Israel saying no real reconstruction aid will be allowed into Gaza unless a prisoner swap agreement is reached. So what happens next? Joining to discuss is founder and director of Palestinian Media Watch, Itamar Marcus. Uh, Itamar, it's great to have you with us. Now, starting with Hamas threats, based on the rhetoric that we're hearing, do you think that a new round of violence is imminent? The, uh, the new round of violence will be dependent on uh, how many of the terror attacks in the next uh, week or two are successful from the Palestinian perspective. That means that they end up actually killing Israelis. Um, there's a lot of hate in the background now of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the people are very angry at their leadership. Uh, Hamas is calling for violence. The Palestinian leadership themselves, the Palestinian Authority, is also calling for violence, glorifying the terrorists, um, demonizing Israel when we kill a terrorist. All of this creates a tremendous atmosphere of hatred. Um, and you've got any number of thousands of Palestinians who might have considered being a terrorist at any time. And when you have this kind of peak of hate promotion, uh, a few of them are going to try. What we've seen in the past is when there's a successful, tragically successful attack and Israelis are killed or a few Israelis are killed, then all those people who are waiting on the sidelines, they decide, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to be the next hero. And then we could have a wave that could go for anything from a couple of weeks to a couple of months. This is what happened in 2014 and happened in 2015. Both times it was successful terror attacks after a number of weeks of failed attacks or minor attacks. Those successful attacks then launched terror waves in the first one in 2014. 14 people were killed. And then the longer one in 2015, uh, over 40 Israelis were killed. So we have to hope that all these terror attacks are, are, are thwarted and that the terrorists are killed or arrested. Uh, and that will hopefully put a, damp, a damper on the desire by all these people who are in the background waiting. All right, well, you know, Hamas, I want to stay on Hamas for a bit and then, and then we'll move on to, to touch on, on some more things that you just mentioned. But Hamas seemingly is increasingly frustrated with Egypt. Does the terror group feel more or less isolated these days? And, and if so, what changed from Egypt's perspective? Uh, Hamas is, um, uh, there are things that Hamas says and there are things that Hamas really means. Hamas's main uh, competitor is the Palestinian Authority. They want to be popular uh, in the Palestinian population in Judean Samaria, West Bank. Uh, they need to increase popularity there. Uh, they've been successful in the last few months uh, since the uh, elections that were supposed to happen in May that the Palestinian Authority canceled, they have become very popular and they want to keep that popularity up. Tragically, the way they remain popular is by attacking Israelis, by uh, by taking claiming a responsibility for attacks on Israelis. So while they're telling the world they're frustrated with Egypt and all sorts of other things, uh, they want to increase attacks within Judea and Samaria so that they can tell their people, look what we're doing to Israelis. And if they succeed, then their popularity will even go up higher. All right, I want to move on now to the pay for slay policy, the PA just cut its wages for actual you know, administrators and government workers again, this so that they could afford the terror stipends that, that you know, Israel withheld uh, in tax returns equal to the amount of those salaries. For how much longer is, is that sort of situation tenable? Because as, as I see it, as more and more terrorists are earning money from the budget, there's still only so much budget coming in. You know, so at what point will the PA be paying more in terror salaries than it's earning in taxes and international aid, et cetera? Exactly. That is, yeah. look, yeah. the Palestinian Authority has lost yeah. Yeah. Uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, probably over a billion dollars a year in foreign aid since Palestinian Media Watch first exposed the salaries to terrorists. 
if we're going to go back to 2011, which was the highest year in Palestinian Authority foreign aid, they had over 2.6 billion uh, shekels a year. Uh, and this year they're down to, I'm sorry, dollars a year. And this year they're down to about 244 million uh, uh, dollars. So that, that's a massive drop. It's older 90%. What happened in 2011 is PMW exposed the salaries to terrorists. And since then, they've been losing money. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. The PA could be rolling in money today um, if they wouldn't have started, uh, if they wouldn't have exposed to the world and, and let us find that they were paying salaries to terrorists. They've lost all the funding from the US, Australia, the Netherlands, Canada. They've lost uh, most of the funding from uh, from the Arab world. They've lost some funding from the Europeans. All of this because they insist on paying salaries to terrorists. What's the problem for the PA? Uh, once the world started putting pressure on them, the PA uh, doubled down on their arguments that they will always pay salaries to terrorists. There have been hundreds of filler clips on Palestinian TV, where you see Mahmoud Abbas speaking on TV, and he says, if we have one penny left, we're going to give it in salaries to terrorists. So he said this one time, but the PA has broadcast this hundreds of times. In other words, they backed themselves into a corner. If the PA today were to uh, say that they would stop paying salaries to terrorists, those, let's say, 20 or 30 percent of the Palestinian population that still supports the PA, that would be gone too, and it would go down to ten or five percent. You know, looking back at the terror attack that we that we had this morning, a young girl of you, I believe she was 14, 15 years old from Sheikh Jarrah, stabbing an, an Israeli mother in front of her children in, in Jerusalem. Now, of course, we're heartbroken for the mother and the victim, you know, and and her kids. But I, I'm also at the same time, I'm looking at this as a 14 year old girl who just threw her life away at the instruction of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I mean, even worse, she could have been killed during the attack by, by IDF or security forces. What, what is being done in terms of uh, addressing Palestinian Authority child abuse? Exactly. That is the exact term. And I've given many lectures around the world, which I called uh, under the title of child, uh, Palestinian Authority Child Abuse, where show exactly how the Palestinian Authority brainwashes young children to believe, uh, teenagers to believe that this is what's expected of them, this is heroic, this will turn them into Palestinian heroes. Well, and we're seeing a lot. Uh, so I mean, example, the last few attacks have all been teens. That's right, that's right. The, to take, for example, Ahmed Manasra, this was in 2015, but a typical example, um, he stabbed, uh, he and his 13-year-old cousin both stabbed some Israelis, the Israelis weren't killed, um, his cousin was killed and he was arrested. Well, Ahmed bin Nasr became a Palestinian hero and a month after he was arrested and everybody knew he was 13, everyone knew he was arrested for stabbing Israelis. You know what the PA did? Named a sporting event for, for schools in Ramallah after Ahmed bin Nasr. Uh, they had named dozens, dozens, hundreds of sporting events uh, after terrorists. I'll give you another example. If you go into a Bethlehem school, you'll see a stone plaque in front of the school, and it's dedicated to Ayat al a 17-year-old girl suicide bomber. So these 17-year-olds who go to school every day, they see the name of a 17-year-old being honored. The Palestinian Authority message to its young children is if you want to be a hero, if you want to be a Palestinian hero, if you want the fast track to remain a Palestinian, in, in the memory of all Palestinians, go be a terrorist. And you have many Palestinian children who might be unhappy, who might be shunned by their friends, who might be unpopular, who might have been shamed on, on Facebook. And they decide, you know what? I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to show them. And what do they do? They do what the Palestinian Authority has been teaching them to do. Here's your fast track to being a Palestinian hero. Go out and attack an Israeli. All right. Well, of course, we're hoping for the best uh, in the future. Itamar Marcus, thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing your insights. Thank you very much.